Good morning, everyone, again. I see you folks, and I address you folks, and I forget those that are quite a ways away in some places. And so I want to welcome those that are joining us online as well. It's amazing what technology has done for us. The Bible says that knowledge would increase, both reference to understanding the Bible in particular, but there's it's an increase of knowledge that is incredible. The things that men has come about to do, and I think I'll just leave it at that point, and go back to where we are going to go today. How many have had a good week? Good to be in God's house now, correct? That it is. I'm grateful for the fact that we can come together yet. I think not too far down the line, we may have the opportunity, we may lose the opportunity just to come together like we are today. But while we are going to allow, God's going to allow us to meet, by God's grace, I'm going to be here. Are you? Amen. Today I wanted to talk about God. I called it our awesome God. And we say God, and many people say God, and they have it in many, use that word in many different contexts. Some are positive and some are very negative. Some understand what they're saying and some have no clue what they're saying. And so as we leave today, I want us to go away knowing that we serve an awesome God and what that word awesome means. So we can go back and say, yes, I'm thankful. He loves me, even though I may be a sinner. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come because we have no other place to go. We come to you and we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us. I ask, Lord, you hide this piece of clay and speak through me to your people. Use your word. Remind us that you love us so much. You're coming soon. You want us all to be part of your new kingdom where iniquity does not abound at all. There is no iniquity there. No sin. So until we can see you face to face, we ask for your sustaining grace. Fill us now with your spirit, we pray, and open our minds to see who you are. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Awe means awesome, means awe-inspiring. I thought awesome was just be defined by itself, but it says no, awesome means to be awe-inspiring. And then the dictionary says, awe is a mixed feeling of reverence, fear, and wonder caused by something majestic and sublime. And you can continue that path of the adjectives. Then the synonym, awe, refers to a feeling of fearful or profound respect or wonder inspired by greatness, superiority, grandeur, etc., of a person or thing and suggest an immobilizing effect. And I thought of the story of Moses. Moses had been trained to be the next Pharaoh, tremendous warrior, general, leader of armies. But then he thought he would do things his way instead of God's way, and so he killed somebody and ran for his life. Then he kept sheep for 40 years, thereabouts. And one day, up on the mountain in the valley, he saw a bush, apparently it must have been a green bush, on fire. But the funny thing was, the bush wasn't being consumed. And Moses said, I got to go see this. And so he walked over and went toward it. And he got so close. And then the bush spoke to him. Moses called him by name. Would that inspire you to say, hey, where am I? And who are you? And the Bible suggests that Moses kind of, he was awe-inspired to recognize that he was talking to the God of creation. And what did God tell Moses? Take off your shoes because where you're standing is what? Holy ground. 
Uh, that's as far as I want to go in Moses' story because it kind of stopped him in his tracks. That's all. But then reverence is also used as it describes this word awe and awesome. And reverence is applied to a feeling of deep respect mingled with love for something or someone holds sacred or inviolably or inviolable and suggests a display of homage, deference. I want to spend a little time on this word deference. I will defer to you. When we recognize who God is, then we say we want to defer to Him because He knows what's best. But how many people today think they know better than God? I don't want to hear that because, well, it's not convenient for me. It's not doesn't fit my world, my way of thinking. Therefore, no, thank you. Because deference is a yielding in opinion and judgment and wishes to someone else. Imagine what the world would become if we all would defer to God's directives. Would it change our world? Let's not go outside the world. How about the church? If every member of the church would say, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. Come what may, I will defer to what you wish. Would it change our church? Would it change your life? Now, if we say yes, my question then is, why don't we defer to God's plan? Hmm? And I heard, as it were, it says a voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Revelation 19.6 Awesome. Our God is omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? All powerful. Now do you understand that term? I don't think we do. It doesn't fit into our little minds. Anything God chooses to, he can do. Anything except what? God, the Bible says, cannot lie. He says, I am the truth. I can't lie. But anything else I can do. That is demonstrated in Genesis chapter 1. I'm not going to go through the whole series, but just emphasize this one part. The Bible says in the beginning, the world was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then it says, and God said, let there be, what? Light. And what happened? And there was light. And every day he said, let there be, and the Bible says, it was. Now, do you understand what it would be if God said, let there be a church over there. I needed to have through two stories. I need to have all the, the common, what is the, 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 the present technological advancements all installed so we can make good use of it. And God could literally say, let there be, and it would be there. My question is, do you really believe that? We say we do. Why is it important to believe? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, I want to read it because I dare not miss any part of it. I've read it many, many, many times and quoted it too, but I'm going to read it this morning. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who, what? Diligently seek him. How do we seek God? Sporadically? When it's convenient? Once in a while? What does the word diligent imply? Continual. Another one. 
Diligence. What does it imply? Continual, he says. Anyone else? Consistently. And here it says, I must believe God is. If I'm going to come to him and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now that means that I live in a state of, come, how would I would express myself? We live in a state of the awareness of the presence of God with us. Parents. Most of us here are parents. Remember when your little ones were two, three, four, five, six years of age? Maybe even 10, 12 years of age? You bake some cookies. Or you just clean something up. Or you just wash the floor. And your directive was, do not touch the cookies. Do not come into this floor because it's not dry yet. And almost invariably, somebody had to test the cookies and check the floor. Correct? Or maybe you did that. That's what I used to do. We did that. We were not willing to defer to mom's opinion, to mom's directive, to mom's judgment, to mom's wishes. We had to employ our own, and that is still being practiced today by most people in reference to God. I submit to you that the commandment that is most consistently broken is commandment number one. What does that say? First commandment. Thou shalt have what? No other gods before me. Now today in our world, do we bow down to wood and stone and idols? No. Then what is God saying? In that commandment, he's saying anything, anyone who comes before God becomes your God. My husband, my wife. My children, my work, my fortune, my car, if you please. All kinds of things people let get before God. I will think the most important thing or the greatest violation of that first commandment is we allow our opinion to take God's opinion. You agree with that? I know, but... You ever heard people say that? I mean, the Bible says, but... You ever heard anybody say that? I've heard a lot of people tell me that. That's your opinion, but... No, it's not. It's what the Bible says. Our God is an awesome God. The Bible says He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He can speak things into being. Now, the next one I want to stress about God's character is... The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8... He who does not love, does not know, K-N-O-W, God. Why? Comma, for God is what? Love. Now the word here that's translated love is that word agape again, and it means a giving of oneself, a self-sacrificing for the benefit of someone else. That is our God. Awesome God he is. And he loves us in spite of ourselves. I'm reading through the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, you have a description of some of the world today. Every man did what was good in his own eyes. That attitude is very prevalent today. You don't tell me what to do, and I don't tell you what to do. Everybody do what, do what you wish. And the Bible says in there in Judges, there are several different judges mentioned. After Joshua passed off the sin, God raised up judges to judge Israel. And for a period of time, they would deliver them by God's grace. But when that judge passed away, they went right back to doing what they weren't supposed to do. And my question, you know, I have a, maybe it's my problem. You know, we, I like to sing. I don't sing very well. I just make a joyful noise. But um, 
some of the choruses that I hear people sing sometimes, they have about 10 to 12 words. And they repeat those words over and over and over again for about three or four minutes. They vary the tune, same words. And I have coined this I response to that kind of a song. And I, trust me, I sing the choruses and I enjoy them too. But there are some of them that I've heard and I'm thinking, please don't insult my intelligence. I heard you the first time. And sometimes the messages of those songs are beautiful. And maybe we need to repeat them over and over. That'll be ingrained in our thinking. But God loves us in spite of the fact that we don't always do what he says. Now in this love of, of God was manifested toward us, and we find that in Revelation chapter, in John, 1 John chapter 4, and verses uh, 9 through 11, it refers also what we, we know very well in John 3.16. It says, In this love, God was manifested toward us, that God was sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Now notice it doesn't say we might live without Him. We live how? Through Him. So apart from Christ, there is no eternal life. Apart from Christ, there is no real life. Because Jesus said, I've come today, may have life and have it how? More abundantly. So those who are refusing to do what God says, are their lives an abundant, joyful, peaceful life? I haven't met any people that have rejected God, who are just kind and contented and patient and loving and caring. They're just not that way. And most of the time, they are hurting themselves, along with hurting other people. But because they don't understand who God is, they refuse to accept him. It continues in the next verse, and this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, a sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also should love one another. The 11th commandment. John 13, you know the verse, 35, I think it is. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. And there's a qualifier there, as Jesus put there. What is the qualifier? You must love one another how? As what? I have loved you. So if we have perfect love, we shall know that God is not, if we have perfect love, we know that God is not seeking to injure us, but that in the midst of trials and griefs and pains, he is seeking to make us perfect and to test the quality of our faith. When we cease to worry about the future and begin to believe that God loves us, and I might say he has the future in his hands, and means to do us good, we shall trust him as a child trusts a loving parent. Then our troubles and torments, torments will disappear, and our will will be swallowed up in the will of God. Awesome. Because we have such difficulty believing, I read that verse in Hebrews 11, verse 6, because... I find that to be basic to our success as a Christian. If we can't believe, we can't be saved. you realize that? That's a serious indictment, isn't it? If I can't believe, I can't be saved. My forgiveness is not because I feel forgiven, it's because God promised that He would, if I do this, He's going to do that. I have to believe that. And when I think of all the things that, you know, I read the story of the judges and all these people, they, they, they've been, here's the, this judge, and they do, and they get people back on track. Gideon was one of them. And then he goofed up, bringing in idolatry and other things. And the people got back into trouble. In fact, it's recorded there in the judges, God says, listen, you thought you have other gods, then call on them, let them help you out. 
But after calling on all their gods, nothing happened. They said, but no, 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 we sinned, Lord. We went against you. Forgive us, please. And our awesome God says, okay. And he sends another judge to save them. And it's interesting that these people lived a successful, peaceful life under the judge for the lifetime of the judge. And then it says again, and they went back to doing the stupid things they did before. You know, I think maybe if we read the Bible more consistently, more frequently, we'll be reminded we are just like them. We haven't changed very much, have we? We try to, we pray to, we wish to, we profess, and then we can run and do what we said we weren't going to do. But our awesome God always loves us anyhow. Another verse... Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our God and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. You just sit and meditate on that verse for a while. His understanding is infinite. Infinite means what? Boundless. That's God's understanding. There's nothing that's too big or too small for him. Another verse. Talk is rushing me now. Hebrews 4, verse 13. And it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I heard a young man told me this one day. I was, I don't know what I was doing. We got to talking for a few minutes and he said, you must be a Christian. I said, yes. Oh, he said, you got to keep the commandments. I don't. And I said, where did you learn that from? I haven't found anywhere in the Bible that I have to keep the, Bible, the commandments because I'm a Christian, but you're not a Christian, therefore you don't have to. So is it okay for me to steal from you? No. Is it okay for you to steal from me? No. If you steal from me, I call the police. If you steal from me, I call the police. If I steal from you, you call the police. So it's an infraction. But they fought... You're a Christian, you keep the commandments. I'm not a Christian, I don't have to. Is that the way the world thinks today? Seems like it, isn't it? Seems like it. And is things get, are things getting better or are they getting worse? Getting worse. God knew what he was talking about when he said, we, you need me. And since you can't know me unless I reveal myself to you, I, as an awesome God, will reveal myself to you and let you know who I am. And he's done so. Revelation chapter 19, 1 and 2 says these, And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to our Lord, our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. That's the part I want to stress. His judgments are true and righteous. I heard just, I was just less, I guess I was going through erasing my emails. I hadn't done it for several days and it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sin for me because there's so many. Junk mail, most of it. But one story got my attention. I was just looking at the headlines and just mainly just this one, go, go, go. But it says righteous judgments. And here is a couple now. They, again, because of the selfishness of men's hearts, it's a couple. They have a 12 year old son. They had divorced. Doesn't give the reasons. They came to the judge. And they're dealing with the idea of visitation rights. Okay? When do I get to see my son? When he goes this weekend with me and that weekend with mom. There's a lot of people do it that way. But the judge says to the lady, something that she mentioned or she said, I don't know what precipitated the comment, but he asks her directly, have you been vaccinated? And she says, no. 
then you cannot see your son until you're vaccinated. That's in the paper. That was the story. And the lawyers were both, where did that come from? You see, God's judgments are righteous always. So we don't have to be afraid of God. We have to be submissive to him. Asking for his forgiveness, which he's happy to provide for us. Because he's an awesome God. Awe-inspiring God. Proverbs tells us, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14.34 So our God. I could go for another little bit, but I think I'm going to quit. I have one more comment here. Are you glad that you serve a God like that? A God who didn't let you go looking for him, but he came looking for us. Now, the Garden of Eden story is amazing to me. God said, now don't eat of that fruit. The day you do, you will die. Satan comes along and says, no, no, you won't die. And he had all his strategy to cause Eve to question God. And brethren, when it comes to this infection that's going around, and it comes to the cancer that you experience, when it comes to the disease that you may have contracted, or whatever other issue that happens, the accident that you're involved in, and we ask ourselves, Lord, why me? Don't question God. He's not to blame for anything that is done evil in this world. The parable Jesus told, The servant said, Master, didn't you sow good seed? Where are all the tears coming from? Jesus' response was, an enemy has done this. And brethren, we have an enemy just as true as those lights that are shining, and Satan himself. And not just Satan, his, all of his angels, they're all one thing, and their objective is to destroy you and me. And anyone who will refuse to surrender their life to Christ, he says, my objective is destroy. Yes, God is an awesome God. He loves us in spite of our sinful ways. He's a forgiving and transforming God who wants the best for us and ultimately he to have us live with him in a perfect world. Now, I for one would like to be in that perfect world, would you? But how do we get there? Can't work my way there, can I? Nope. Can I have to do just so many good deeds and I get there? That doesn't work either. So what gets me to heaven? My faith in the promises of God. That's it. When the jailer said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? What is his response? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. Why? Because we serve an awesome God who loves us with a passion. He has given us choice. That's a whole other subject. I started on that one, but I didn't finish that sermon, so I changed he gave us choice. And we decide to live or die forever. His counsel is choose life. I have no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. But he would turn from his wicked ways and follow me. Choose to surrender our lives to Jesus. To I defer to Jesus. I defer to Jesus. Will you defer to him with me? Did you get that? I defer to Jesus. Will you? Some will. Will you? 
I mean, heard it louder. Will you defer to the God of the universe who is an awesome God? Yes, folks. And if you defer to Christ, you can never be wrong. They may kill you. But if you defer to Christ, you're fine. You have salvation. They can take your life, they can't give it back. God can allow them to take your life. That's fine. He says, that's good. That's, that means they can't suffer no more. Can't hurt my friends no more. But I can give them back their life. When I come. And it'll give me great joy to bring them back to life. To live with me for eternity. That's the God we serve. Don't turn your back on Jesus, please. So today, how many will say with me, Lord, by your grace, I defer to you from this day forward. Huh? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't deserve anything. We just need everything. You don't deserve Jesus, but we thank you that you provided his sacrifice for our sins. We know he's coming again soon because you promised. You've given us signposts along the way so we will know when we're almost home. Help us to see the signs. Help us to believe what we see and hear. And to know that your word is sure and always comes to pass. You said today is the day of salvation and today we raise our hands and say, Lord, we defer to Jesus today. Our desire is that you live out your life within us. Help us to make that choice every morning. And remember, remind us throughout the day of the choice that we made. To understand, Lord, that our choices determine our eternal destiny. What we are to be, we are now becoming. So guide us, please. Protect us. And grant us that peace that knoweth no understanding. Knowing that you're in charge and we have nothing to fear. As you said, perfect love casts out fear. Thank you for loving us and for honoring our feeble requests. Forgive us. We ask you, Lord, to empower us to live like Jesus. Always be willing to defer to what he says. From this day forward, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.